All right, so we're going to start talking about antimicrobial treatment. All right, so most of this lecture is going to have to deal with <clears throat> antimicrobial agents that we use against bacteria. We'll talk briefly about antimicrobial agents against fungi and protozoans, and finally, viruses. And then we'll talk about the consequences of use of certain antibiotics. Some of the damaging effects. All right, so when you're thinking about antibiotics, all right, what are what are some factors or criteria that you want to take into account when choosing the right antibiotic to prescribe? And as a as a nurse, <clears throat> you may not be the one prescribing antibiotic unless you're a nurse practitioner, but you will be looking at the charts and you may note that a patient may have a certain allergy to a class of antibiotics or there may be a, a strange uh, combination of drugs that you haven't seen before or doesn't look right. So you can always kind of double check. Right? So it's important for you to understand on antibiotics that some of the factors, um, some of the risk factors of using antibiotics as well as some of the factors that are involved in choosing the right antibiotic. All right, so the first, <clears throat> first issue is what types of pathogens are you dealing with? Are you using, are you dealing with a bacterium? Are you dealing with a gram-positive bacterium? Are you dealing with a gram-negative bacterium? Are you dealing with a bacterium that has no cell wall, like a mycoplasma? Are you dealing with a bacterium that's got mycolic acid, so a mycobacterium species? Are you dealing with a bacterium that's completely intracellular, so it's an obligate intracellular pathogen? Are you dealing with a, a virus? Are you dealing with a fungus? Or are you dealing with a protozoan? All right, so it's going to be important for you to choose the right type of drug based on the pathogen. What are the possible side effects? What type of host toxicity are you looking at? How, what dosage should you use a drug? How much should you give a patient? What drugs are typically used for, for infants or children or adult children or adults? Does the drug have a broad or narrow spectrum of activity. All right, so when you're talking about a broad spectrum of activity, it means that it's kind of all-inclusive and that it's useful against both gram-positive and gram-negative species. A narrow spectrum drug tends to target one class of organisms and particularly one group of organisms, so gram-positive or gram-negative. Even within the, the confines of a group, a bacteria, it's more useful against one type of bacterium within that group than another. How does that drug work? What is its mechanism of action? What does it target? <clears throat> this ties in with the uh, the toxicity. All right, so remember that you're dealing with a drug. A molecule is designed to target a specific organism, but it's a drug, and that drug has a binding site, and that binding site might be a bacterial cell or a, a fungal cell or a virus, but sometimes drugs bind to host cell receptors as well, and so you see toxicity. All right, what about the patient history? <clears throat> you know, this patient may be suffering from more than just one type of infection. 
what types of antibiotics have they, have they had in the past? Is this a reoccurring problem? Are they really ill? Do they have any um, underlying conditions that would uh, potentially compromise their immune system? Is their infection a secondary infection or super infection instead of the primary infection that they have? And then you gotta think about the, the organism in question. Just because you have a bacterial species and you know what it is, <clears throat> your, your hospital lab will be running antibiotic tests on the, on the pathogen they culture to determine what drugs this pathogen is most susceptible to and which one it shows resistance to. Just because you, you know the organism in question doesn't mean that it's necessarily susceptible to you know, a certain drug because it's been used in the past or has worked before, it may not work again. So this is where you have to keep up in the literature. All right, you have to keep up with any, any reports of antimicrobial resistance to certain drugs within a given area or location. You know, in your community, whether it be your hospital or it be your county or it be your state, is there a higher incidence of resistance to a certain group of drugs for a particular pathogen? And if that's the case, what do you prescribe? What, what, what would be your method of treatment of the patient? Because you have to have some alternative, right? Because your, your drug of choice is, gonna be, is not going to be very effective. <clears throat> and then how and where are the drug going to be administered? That's going to be important. Or is it going to be oral, orally administered? Is it going to be a suppository? Is it going to be um, injected? Is it intramuscular? Is it intravascular? Um, <clears throat> is it some kind of transdermal patch? And then where will it be administered? What location of the body? And then you gotta worry about the stability of the drug. What happens to that drug once it enters the bloodstream? Um, think about the chemical properties of a drug. Um, is it able to cross a membrane barrier effectively? Uh, does it need some type of transport protein? Once it's in the body, how do host proteins interact with that drug? Do they inactivate the drug? Um, do host enzymes target and break down the drug? Um, so you have to think about that. All right, so looking at the, <clears throat> the root of administration of a drug. All right, so you're looking at the, the time course from injection on. All right, so and you're looking at the concentration of the drug in the blood. All right, so if it's intravascular, it's gonna have a really high concentration initially in the blood. And as it makes its way through to other target sites, you'll see this concentration over time drops precipitously. All right, but what about if it's intraperineal injection? All right, there's a little bit of a, a lapse in time for this type of, of injection. <coughs> All right, because you have to worry about the drug actually crossing uh, membrane barriers to get into the bloodstream. And then you have intramuscular, which has a little bit longer length of time. Again, it's got to get into the bloodstream so let's cross a bunch of barriers in terms of uh, tissues. And then you have oral administration of the drug. So you're going to see a longer time. And notice that these different types of injections and administrations of the drug in question, they don't reach the same threshold or concentration of the drug in the bloodstream. There's a there's a loss of the drug. 
that you administer in terms of a dosage. So you want an effective dose, but for it to actually get to its target site, once it gets there, how effective is it? All right, so these drugs, <coughs> you want them to be water soluble, right? So they can pass through um, channel proteins, aquaporin, so they can get passed through the membrane. Um, some drugs are lipid soluble, so they can pass right through the cell membrane itself. All right, other drugs require active transport, some type of carrier molecule to pump the drug into and past tissue barriers. So again, the chemical properties of a drug will affect how well it crosses membranes. All right, so you have to keep in mind cell membrane structure. Whether you're talking about cell membrane structure of our cells or our body, or you're talking about host membrane or uh, cell, cell membrane structure of a bacterium or a fungus or a protozoan. All right, so <clears throat> what are some of the different types of methods that are used for determining antibiotic sensitivity? Well, already in lab, we've gone over the Kirby-Bauer test, which is basically the disk diffusion assay. In this case, here, we're looking at a, a test tube dilution test, where you're looking for the MIC, Right. The MIC is the minimum inhibitory concentration. All right, so the minimum inhibitory concentration. All right, so you have the same inoculum size, concentration, amount of a certain bacterium that you add to a broth culture. And then you add varying concentrations of a drug. So here you have initially your negative control for your drug. You have no drug in the broth culture at all. And then you slowly increase the concentration of the drug from 0.2 to 12.8 micrograms per mil, for example, in this scenario. And <clears throat> you'll notice that your control broth, it has no antibiotics, so you would expect the bacteria to grow. But here, as you increase the concentration of the drug, the amount of turbidity of the broth decreases. All right, so here, You see a kind of range for the drug is starting to kill off the bacteria. You have lower turbidity and then you have no turbidity from 3.2 to 6.4 micrograms per mil. Alright, where you see growth and no growth. Alright, so somewhere in this range you have a minimal inhibitory concentration. That's going to be the lowest concentration needed to kill the bacteria, where you have no microbial growth. <clears throat> All right, so here you can use a test tube or you can use a well plate. The well plate, the same idea. You have a broth culture, you add a certain concentration of bacteria, and then you add a certain concentration of drug, and you dilute it out. All right, and here you have the positive growth control, so it's nice and pink. All right, so everything that's pink is showing growth. All right, so here for the amphotericin B, for example, this dilution, you have no growth. 
for the fluconazole, much, much higher dilution. <coughs> All right, so here, get an idea of where these drugs, based on their concentration, based on the dilution, what the minimum inhibitory concentration of that drug is against a particular pathogen. All right, so thinking about this minimum inhibitory concentration, it's useful, all right, because you have to keep in mind the therapeutic dosage, all right, the therapeutic index, all right, which is the ratio of the dose of the drug that is toxic to us compared to its minimum effective therapeutic dosage. All right, so the smaller the ratio, all right, the greater the potential for host cell toxicity. All right, so here you're shown a toxic dose of 10 micrograms per mil. The minimum inhibitory concentration of the drug in question, the drugs in question, are either 9 micrograms per mil or 1 microgram per mil. All right, so the smaller the ratio of the therapeutic index, all right, the riskier it is to administer. The wider the range, the broader, the higher the number, the safer choice. All right, so to kind of explain this um, idea of the therapeutic index, what we have here is we have the ED50, all right, the therapeutic effective dose of the drug, all right, the dose required to produce a therapeutic effect in 50% of the population, which is a nice little round, round standard, all right. And then here you have the toxic dosage, TD50, the dose required to produce toxic effects in 50% of the population. Well, if you divide the TD50 by the ED50, all right, that gives you your therapeutic index. Now, look at what you're doing when you're comparing these two ranges. All right, so if your therapeutic index is really narrow, all right, you're only giving yourself a very small dosage window to work with where you run the risk of a drug being more toxic than it is effective. But if you have a wider or higher therapeutic index, you have a much wider dosage range that you can administer and still have confidence that the drug is not going to have as debilitating toxic effects on your uh, patient. All right, so which of the following antibiotics would be the safest choice for a patient with no exceptional medical history? All right, so you have drug A. You have zone of inhibition of 30 milliliters with a therapeutic index of 1.2. You have a zone of inhibition for drug B, 20 millimeters, with a therapeutic index 12. Now, the first thing you're looking at is a zone of inhibition. You see 30 millimeters compared to 20. Wow, that particular drug is really effective against that organism, right? But it's therapeutic index is really low. All right, so even though it's really effective against the organism, it's potentially toxic to us at that particular dosage. So it's a little bit safer to choose drug B, all right? Because even though you have a smaller zone of inhibition, the therapeutic index is higher, all right? So it's the safer choice. All right, so we talked about previously uh, the different types of, of disinfectants and chemical reagents that are used on microorganisms or inanimate objects, for that matter, to eliminate or reduce the, the number of microbes.
those same type of chemical properties of the of any type of disinfectant or sterilant all right is going to be or sanitizer it's going to also tie in with an, an ideal antibiotic all right so keeping in mind that you know of course when you're talking about sanitizers you don't want to be soluble in body fluids and stuff but some of these ideas are gonna line up so a, a, an ideal antibiotic is going to be soluble in body fluids all right you want it to be soluble in aqueous solutions You want very selective toxicity. All right, you want high toxicity against the organism in question, but you want low toxicity for the host. <clears throat> now, you don't want the toxicity of a drug in question to be altered by the body. All right, so the drug in question is going to pass through the liver. All right, now, certain drugs as they pass through the liver can be altered so that they, <coughs> so that they lose their potency, okay, which is a problem. All right, so that means you would have to increase the dosage to reach the particular desired effect. Other drugs, as they pass through the liver, actually become bioactivated, and they become toxic, which is the other problem. So you want a nice stable drug that's not going to be easily changed. You also want it to be a poor allergen. Right, so you don't want to have a drug that is going to induce any allergic effects. You want to choose a drug that's not going to allow for um, the organism to develop resistance as easily. want a long shelf life for the drug. And you want to make it affordable. You know, what's the point of, of making a drug that's a cure-all? All right, this is an issue right now. All right, they have a drug that can treat hepatitis C. All right, they can cure it. It's actually a combination drug, and <clears throat> the problem is that a single dosage is a thousand dollars, and that the twelve-week course of the of the drug in question is about mm, 80, 85 grand, which you know people who really really need the drug can't afford. All right, so there has to be some kind of reasonable cost to the drug in question. All right, so this is also why we have uh, generic forms of drugs. All right, so they're manufactured at a reasonable cost so that the patients can actually afford the drugs that they need to treat their infections or conditions. All right, so Let's talk about different sites on a, a bacterial cell that you might want to target using some type of antimicrobial drug. All right, so this is where we start tying in uh, previous chapters. All right, so this is where we're going to start talking about bacterial cell structure, fungal cell structure, protozoal cell structure, viral structure, all their particular specific components, what makes them what they are, what makes them different from 
human eukaryotic cells and what we can use to target them for destruction. All right, so think about a bacterial cell. All right, it has a cell wall made of peptidoglycan. All right, so you have groups of drugs that target and inhibit cell wall synthesis. All right, so your, your penicillins, your cephalosporins, your vancomycin. All right, you can inhibit protein synthesis. All right, there's all different groups of drugs we'll talk about that disrupt protein synthesis in different ways. All right, you can inhibit DNA replication in bacteria. You can disrupt transcription of genes. You can target the bacterial cell membrane and you can disrupt metabolic pathways. All right, so looking at antimicrobial drugs, a little bit more specifically, and what they target. All right, so this figure shows you the different cl classes of drugs, or right, groups of drugs, that target a particular site. All right, so you have your penicillins, your cephalosporins, and other variant, variant drugs that target cell wall synthesis. All right, you have your quinolones that target DNA gyrase. All right, so DNA gyrase is a <clears throat> is a topoisomerase. All right, so if you recall what a topoisomerase does, it helps to relieve any torsional stress in the DNA as it's being replicated ahead of the the replication fork. All right, so to relieve any uh, kinks in the strands. All right, so quinolones prevents this from happening, so it basically halts uh, DNA replication. Your, your sulfonamides, your trinethoprim, groups of drugs, these target uh, folic acid metabolism. All right, so uh, keep in mind that these particular groups of drugs work as um, competitive inhibitors. All right, for folic acid synthesis. And at this in turn, the folic acid ties in with the DNA because the folic acid functions as a precursor for basically your, uh, your nucleotides. All right, for DNA replication. You have drugs like rifampin, which disrupts RNA polymerase. All right, so you basically stop the process of transcription. All right. And then you have other drugs that specifically target the the ribosome of bacterial cells. All right, so you have drugs that target the 50S large subunit. And you have drugs that target the 30S small subunit of the ribosome. And these disrupt protein synthesis. Now, talking about the different types of drugs and what their targets are, you know, I start thinking about different types of antibiotic resistance. All right, well, if you're talking about antibiotic resistance, how would a bacterium develop resistance to a drug? Well, one thing is the target molecule of that drug is somehow altered. All right, so that drug doesn't bind to its substrate because it doesn't recognize its substrate. 
the bacterial cell or bacterium alters its membrane components. All right, so recall that the membrane of a cell can be composed of fatty acids that are either completely saturated in hydrogen atoms, so saturated fatty acids, or unsaturated fatty acids with double bonds and kinks in the structure. So by altering the permeability of the cell, you can basically prevent that drug from entering. or at least slow it down. A bacterium could have an enzyme which targets and activates the drug, or it completely destroys the antimicrobial drug. Right. You could alter the protein, or the enzyme, so that it has higher affinity for a substrate than some type of competing drug. So you increase the specificity of the enzyme and its affinity for its normal substrate. Alter the metabolic pathway. Have other, have other intermediates. You siphon off and shuttle uh, intermediate molecules into a different pathway or shunt other pathways into other directions. Efflux pumps. All right, you can pump out the drug from the cell. All right, so Looking at different groups of drugs and whether they are bacteriostatic and bactericidal. All right, so remember what static and cidal refer to. If a drug in question or chemical in question is bacteriostatic, all it does is halt the growth. All right, it doesn't kill it. If it's bactericidal, all right, it kills the organism in question. Also keep in mind that if a drug is bactericidal, think about the dosage. At a certain dosage, that same drug could also be bacteriostatic. So it depends on the concentration. All right, so here is a table of drugs, all right? Now, by no means am I gonna have you memorize every single antibiotic and its target mode of action and spectrum of activity, all right? That's pointless, all right? What I want you to memorize, and not necessarily memorize, all right, but I want you to commit to memory, all right, because this will be important later on, are classes of drugs, and maybe remember a, an example that belongs to that class of drugs. All right, so when you're talking about, for instance, drugs that disrupt cell wall synthesis. All right, you have your penicillins and you have your cephalosporins. Those are both classes or groups of drugs that target cell wall synthesis. All right, that's what, that is what I would want you to know. The class of drug and what it targets. And maybe an example of each. All right.
<coughs> and then I may have you take it a step further. I want you to think about that drug. And I want you to think about, hey, would that drug be more useful against a gram positive or a gram negative bacterium? Well, if you're targeting cell wall synthesis, be more effective, usually, against a gram positive organism. Okay. All right, your sulfonamides target folic acid synthesis, folic acid synthesis. All right, your aminoglycosides, your chloramphenicols, tetracyclines, erythromycin, all of these guys are going to disrupt protein synthesis. All right, your quinolones target uh, DNA replication. All right, vancomycin also belongs in this group of cell wall targeting drugs. All right, but it's effective against gram positives. All right, and then looking at <coughs> anti-mycobacterial drugs. All right, so your mycobacterial species, these guys are going to be weakly gram positive and they're going to also have mycolic acid in their membrane, in their cell wall. So you have particular groups of drugs that target them. All right, so something like uh, it's not as it inhibits mycolic acid synthesis. Uh, rifampin, all right, rifampin basically disrupts process of transcription, all right, not just for a mycobacterial species, but these other guys as well, all right. And later on in this, in this PowerPoint presentation, we'll go over different groups of drugs and their mode of action specifically, all right? This is kind of a, an overview or introduction to different types of antimicrobial agents. All right, so if you think about uh, fungal agents, all right? All right, fungi in their, their membrane, all right, they have ergosterol, which is very similar to cholesterol all right, in the membrane of the fungal cell. All right, so you can use something like nystatin to target ergosterol. You can do something like amphotericin B to disrupt the cell membrane function. Um, you can disrupt synthesis of sterols, all right, which leads to the production of gosterol. All right, so you can either target ergosterol or you can inhibit its synthesis. <clears throat> you can prevent uh, cell division in fungi. Uh, you can disrupt um, transcription. All right, you have mabendazole, chloroquine, which you use against your protozoans, okay? Both these drugs target protozoans, mainly. And then you have your antiviral drugs. And we'll talk about different targets of antiviral um, agents. All right, so you can inhibit a virus from uncoating you can inhibit uh, synthesis of viral DNA, viral RNA. Um, you can prevent uh, your retroviral uh, viruses from using reverse transcriptase to convert viral RNA to DNA. 
you can have nucleus, uh, non-nucleoside analogs inhibit reverse transcriptase, um, inhibit proteases, um, and then interferons. All right, so looking at your cell wall targeting antimicrobial agents, all right, you have penicillin, cephalosporin. All right, so these two groups of drugs target cell wall synthesis. All right, so this particular drug was basically found as a complete accident. All right, so you have a case of Alexander Fleming all right, leaving a petri dish out too long, and by happenstance, he found that you have this fungal penicillium colony that's secreting some type of agent that's inhibiting the growth of um, staph species on the plate. All right, so here you have nice, healthy staph species. All right, here you have the penicillium colony, and as the antibacterial agent diffused through the media, all right, becomes lower and lower in concentration. So in this zone of inhibition, you see no growth. And then you do see some cells that are left, but <clears throat> they're undergoing lysis, they're dying, so they're not very healthy. And then you have those that are really healthy out here. All right, so this is basically a, a drug produced by mold. All right, so your your penicillins, your cephalosporins, all right, they have this basic beta-lactam ring structure. <clears throat> all right, and it's the beta-lactam ring that's important in terms of the the drug's activity. Into the bottles they pour the liquid medium in which will grow the mold that produces penicillin. Canada triples its output of the magic drug that affects almost miraculous cures. In an oven, the medium to produce penicillin is sterilized to be sure it is free from germs. Then the girl workers inoculate the medium with the seeds of the penicillin mold. This here in Montreal is incubated. And presently in the bottles, we see the mold that contains the wonder-working drug. Mass production, but all will be needed for soldiers in war. Then from the bottle streams liquid charged with penicillin, the killer of germs. This turned into powder, penicillin ready to be used. <clears throat> all right, so here, <clears throat> what you're looking at is you have a nice little bacterial cell. All right, you have your cell wall structure of peptidic glycan. All right, so N-acetyl muramic acid, N-acetyl clozamine, and you have cross-linking through um, peptide bonds. And <clears throat> you have naturally occurring penicillin G. Um, you have your semi-synthetic uh, drug which is basically a derivative of penicillin G that's been modified in a lab. All right, and then you have your cephalosporins. All right, so each of these has the basic beta-lactam ring structure. All right, so this, these particular drugs disrupt the enzymes that are involved in synthesizing the cell wall. All right, so it prevents the, the cross-linking and the addition of these cross-links in the cell wall structure. And 
<clears throat> basically, these crosslinks are basically chaining together the different layers of the cell wall. And if these links aren't present, then the cell wall weakens. And as the cell wall enlarges, gets bigger, it becomes much more porous. And it becomes much more susceptible to any kind of osmotic pressure changes in the environment. All right, so here you're looking at healthy um, <clears throat> Staphylococcus aureus cells up top. These are nice and healthy. And then down at the bottom, you're looking at cells that have been exposed to penicillin. They are not as healthy. All right. Here, they're actually rupturing. All right, because the cell wall has been weakened. All right, so here you have peptidoglycan. You expose it to some type of cell wall targeting antibiotic. It weakens the peptidoglycan layer. All right, you expose it to hypotonic conditions. All right, water rushes in and the cell lysis. All right, so here you have nice healthy bacterial cells. And here, administration of the penicillin drug, exposed to hypotonic conditions you end up with ghosts, remnants of the bacterial cell that basically burst open. Structurally, most bacteria consist of a cell membrane surrounded by a cell wall and, for some bacteria, an additional outer layer. Internal to the cell membrane is the cytoplasm which contains ribosomes, a nuclear region, and in some cases, granules and or vesicles. Depending on the bacterial species, a number of different external structures may be found, such as a capsule, flagella, and pili. In gram-negative bacteria, the gap between the cell membrane and the cell wall is known as the periplasmic space. Most gram-positive bacteria do not possess a periplasmic space, but have only periplasm, where metabolic digestion occurs and new cell peptidoglycan is attached. Peptidoglycan, the most important component of the cell wall, is a polymer made of N-acetylmuramic acid, alternating with N-acetylglucosamine, which are cross-linked by chains of four amino acids. The function of the bacterial cell wall is to maintain the characteristic shape of the organism and to prevent the bacterium from bursting when fluid flows into the organism by osmosis. Synthesis of the peptidoglycan and ultimately the bacterial cell wall occurs in a number of stages. One of the first stages is the addition of five amino acids to N-acetylmuramic acid. Next, N-acetylglucosamine is added to the N-acetylmuramic acid to form a precursor of peptidoglycan. This peptidoglycan precursor is then transported across the cell membrane to a cell wall acceptor in the periplasm. Once in the periplasm, the peptidoglycan precursors bind to cell wall acceptors and undergo extensive crosslinking. Two major enzymes are involved in crosslinking transpeptidase and d alanyl carboxypeptidase. These enzymes are also known as penicillin binding proteins because of their ability to bind to penicillins and cephalosporins. Eventually, several layers of peptidoglycan are formed, all of which are cross-linked to create the cell wall. Gram-positive bacteria may have more layers than gram-negative bacteria and thus have a much thicker cell wall. Beta-lactam antibiotics include all penicillins and cephalosporins that contain a chemical structure called a beta-lactam ring. This structure is capable of binding to the enzymes that cross-link peptidoglycans. Beta-lactams interfere with cross-linking by binding to transpeptidase and D-alanyl carboxypeptidase enzymes, thus preventing bacterial cell wall synthesis. By inhibiting cell wall synthesis, the bacterial cell is damaged. Gram-positive bacteria have a high internal osmotic pressure. 
Without a normal rigid cell wall, these cells burst when subjected to the low osmotic pressure of their surrounding environment. As well, the antibiotic penicillin binding protein complex stimulates the release of autolysins that are capable of digesting the existing cell wall. Beta-lactam antibiotics are therefore considered bactericidal agents. Bacterial resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics may be acquired by several routes. One of the most important mechanisms is through a process known as transformation. During transformation, chromosomal genes are transferred from one bacterium to another. When a bacterium containing a resistance gene dies, naked DNA is released into the surrounding environment. If a bacterium of sufficient similarity to the dead one is in the vicinity, it will be able to uptake the naked DNA containing the resistance gene. Once inside the bacterium, the resistance gene may be transferred from the naked DNA to the chromosome of the host bacteria by a process known as homologous transformation. Over time, the bacterium may acquire enough of these resistance genes to result in a remodeling of the segment of the host DNA. If this remodeled DNA segment codes for cross-linking enzymes, i.e. penicillin binding proteins, the result is the production of altered penicillin binding proteins. These altered penicillin binding proteins can still cross-link the peptidoglycan layers of the cell wall, but have a reduced affinity for beta-lactam antibiotics, thus rendering the bacterium resistant to the effects of penicillin and other beta-lactam agents. This transfer process has resulted in penicillin-resistant S. pneumoniae through the acquisition of genes from other naturally occurring penicillin-resistant streptococcus species. A second important mechanism by which bacteria become resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics to the cell membrane is the cytoplasm which contains ribosome. <clears throat> All right, so when you're talking about resistance to uh, cell wall targeting antibiotics, <clears throat> here you have your beta-lactam ring structure. All right and your beta-lactamase, your penicillinases, all right, can target this beta-lactam ring, cleave it, so now the drug is inactivated. All right, so this is one uh, particular resistance mechanism, is your beta-lactamases, or penicillinases. All right, which of the following mechanisms of antibiotic resistance act specifically on penicillins and cephalosporins? All right, so you have decreased permeability or uptake of the drug. You have enzymes that are synthesized and inactivate the drug. You have binding sites for drugs that are decreased. You have alternative metabolic pathways. And then you have efflux pumps. All right, so in this case, you have enzymes like penicillinases that target the cell wall targeting drugs, the beta-lactam ring. All right, your polymyxins. All right, your polymyxins intercalate into your bacterial cell membrane. All right, so these are very effective at targeting gram-negative bacteria. Basically, these particular um, drugs, they intercalate into the membrane, they make the membrane porous, all right, so that the membrane is more porous, you lose the permeability of the membrane. All right, daptomycin has a similar function. All right, so here we have some peptide solution you have the interaction of the peptide with the membrane, integration of the peptide with the bacterial cell membrane, it aggregates and forms a pore. All right, so the adaptomycin basically forms this, this channel. 
all right, this little pipe in the membrane. So it weakens the permeability of the cell membrane. So that now substances can freely enter and leave. All right, so by weakening the cell membrane, you end up with <clears throat> bacterial cells that have ruptured. So you end up with what we call uh, protoplast. So here you can see your, your cell wall, cell membrane, and other internal constituents that are basically being released outside the cell. All right, your fluoroquinolones, or specifically, all right, your, your quinolones. Your quinolones target topoisomerase and DNA jarase. Basically, your topo isomerases. All right, so they disrupt DNA replication because they inhibit the uncoiling of the, the kinks in the DNA ahead of the replication fork. In this animation, we demonstrate the biology of DNA replication, leading to bacterial cell division in a gram-positive bacterium, such as S. pneumoniae. The DNA is shown as a circular double strand within the bacterial cell. Like the DNA of all living organisms, it contains the unique genetic code for all of the proteins required for bacterial survival. Bacteria replicate by a process known as binary fission, whereby one bacterium separates into two new daughter cells. However, before this can occur, the bacterium must make an identical copy of its complete circular DNA. DNA replication requires that the two strands of DNA separate so that the genetic code of the bacterium can be read and a new complementary strand can be created for each of the original strands. To accomplish this, various enzymes, known as helicases, break the hydrogen bonds between the bases in the two DNA strands, unwind the strands from each other, and stabilize the exposed single strands, preventing them from joining back together. The points at which the two strands of DNA separate to allow replication of DNA are known as replication forks. The enzyme's DNA polymerase then moves along each strand of DNA behind each replication fork, synthesizing new DNA strands, in red, complementary to the original ones. As the replication forks move forward, positive superhelical twists in the DNA begin to accumulate ahead of them. In order for DNA replication to continue, these superhelical twists must be removed. The bacterial enzyme DNA gyrase, which is also known as topoisomerase 2, is responsible for removing the positive superhelical twists so that DNA replications can proceed. DNA gyrase is an essential bacterial enzyme composed of 2A and 2B subunits, which are products of the GYRA and GYRB genes. This enzyme has other important functions which affect the initiation of DNA replication and transcription of many genes. With the combined involvement of these enzymes, an entire duplicate copy of the bacterial genome is produced as the two replication forks move in opposite directions around the circular DNA genome. Eventually, as the two replication forks meet, two new complete chromosomes have been made, each consisting of one old and one new strand of DNA. This is referred to as semi-conservative replication. In order to allow the two new interlinked chromosomes to come apart, another bacterial enzyme is needed, which is known as topoisomerase 4. This enzyme is structurally related to DNA gyrase and is coded for by the PARC and PARE genes. Topoisomerase 4 allows for the two new interlinked chromosomes to separate, 
so that they can be segregated into two new daughter bacterial cells. This animation will demonstrate two <clears throat> All right, so your Ifabsins. All right, your Ifabsins target the, the enzyme RNA polymerase in bacterial cells, and it disrupts transcription of genes into messenger RNA. Here, you're looking at your antimicrobial agents that target protein all right, synthesis. All right, so each of these are different classes of drugs, your chloramphenicols, your erythromycins, your tetracyclines, and streptomycins, all right? And they all target certain components of this process. All right, so chloramphenicol binds to the 50S portion of the <clears throat> large bacterial ribosomal subunit and inhibits the formation of peptide, peptide bonds. All right, so this prevents your transpeptidase uh, reaction. All right, your erythromycin binds to the 50S portion, prevents the movement of the ribosome along the messenger RNA. So it basically st stalls or halts uh, translation. Uh, your tetracyclines interfere with the attachment of uh, transfer RNA to the mRNA ribosome complex, and then streptomycin uh, changes the 30S complex portion so that it misreads the amino acids. So usually you end up with a uh, some type of a, a reading frame shift. Um, that results in a either an altered protein or a shortened truncated protein due to some type of uh, uh, stop codon. The DNA is shown as a circular double strand within the bacterial cell. Like the DNA of all living organisms, it contains the unique genetic code for all of the proteins required for bacterial survival. These include the proteins required for reproduction, growth, repair, and regulation of metabolism. It also codes for the three kinds of RNA that are essential for carrying out protein synthesis. These are known as ribosomal RNA. RRNA, messenger RNA, mRNA, and transfer RNA, tRNA. In order for the bacteria to begin protein synthesis, the double-stranded DNA molecule must first unwind and separate in the region which codes for the specific protein that is to be made. Only one strand of the DNA serves as a template for this process known as transcription. Transcription results in the formation of messenger RNA, mRNA, which is a mirror copy of the DNA segment. Once the strand of mRNA is complete, it will detach from the DNA template and in turn become attached to ribosomes. Bacterial ribosomes are made of a small 30S and a large 50S subunit. After the two subunits join together around the strand of mRNA, Synthesis of the polypeptide chain begins. This step involves the aligning of transfer RNA, tRNA molecules, and sequence along the mRNA. Each tRNA carries a unique amino acid determined by the sequence of the tRNA, which, when aligned along the mRNA and ribosome, join together to form the polypeptide chain. This step is known as translation. The ribosome will continue to add amino acids to the growing polypeptide chain until it reaches a point along the mRNA that signals it to stop. At this point, it releases the finished protein molecule. <clears throat> 
Macrolide antibiotics, such as erythromycin, act as inhibitors of protein synthesis by attaching to the 50S ribosomal subunit. As a result, they block the ability of the ribosome to synthesize the polypeptide chain. By inhibiting protein synthesis, macrolides are considered bacteriostatic antibiotics. However, at higher concentrations and with lower bacterial density or during rapid bacterial growth, macrolides may be bactericidal. <clears throat> All right, so looking at your uh, sulfonamides and your trimethoprim drugs, all right, both of these function as competitive inhibitors of folic acid synthesis. All right, so for folic acid synthesis, your sulfa drugs, all right, your sulfa drugs mimic the normal substrate of the enzyme involved in the pathway of synthesizing folic acid. All right, so they mimic this paramino benzoic acid. All right, so they all look pretty structurally similar, except for a couple of alterations. All right, these alterations are what interact with the active site of the enzyme. All right, so here, your paramino benzoic acids should form dihydrofolic acid. All right, but if you disrupt this pathway, well, you don't synthesize that dihydrofolic acid. All right, so here you have the paramino benzoic acid binding to its normal enzyme. And here you have your sulfonamide drug that binds to the active site. And now paramino benzoic acid can't bind. So it blocks or prevents the normal substrate from binding. All right, the trimethoprim functions the same way except for it's involved in a different step of this biochemical pathway. All right, a lot of times you actually have more than one type of antimicrobial drug that may be prescribed at one time. So you basically have combination therapy. All right, so here you have a bacterial cell. You have a active um, cell wall targeting antibiotic. And that particular bacterial cell produces beta-lactamase. Well, that beta-lactam ring will be cleaved, so that drug is now inactivated, so the bacterial cells continue to grow. Now, what if you were to combine two drugs? All right, what if you use something like a quinolone drug that's been bound to the cell wall targeting antibiotic? Well. When a beta-lactamase targets the beta-lactam ring, it cleaves it, it releases the quinolone, which targets the bacterial cell, kills it. And then you can have other organisms that don't produce beta-lactamase, and you still have your penicillin-type drug that can target the cell wall of the bacterium. All right, so <clears throat> coming back to this idea of antibiotic resistance mechanisms. All right, so one way a bacteria can become resistant is they alter their cell membrane, their peptidoglycan or outer membrane, you know, layers, preventing the drug from entering the cell. You have efflux pumps for pumping out an antibiotic once it enters. You have A way of inactivating the drug itself, you know, targeting and activating a drug or altering the target of a drug or increasing the specificity of a normal enzyme for its normal cellular target rather than the drug. <clears throat> 
All right, so <clears throat> this kind of gives you the same thing, a little bit broken down, where you have uh, impaired influx of a drug, you have efflux pumping out of a drug, you alter the, the target, you somehow modify the target so that the drug doesn't recognize it, you overproduce a target, so you compete with it. Um, you modify the, the drug itself or you degrade the drug. Uh, 